why they become entrepreneurs, it's not because they want to become the next Elon Musk. It's because they crave in their gut at the most visceral level possible, freedom. Probably the first step is to figure out one thing that you can do better than anybody else. How one goes about increasing the value of their company. She sold her little $9 million business for $54 million. What drives the value of a company? I, I used to run a research company. John, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but I can't sell your company. There's, there's nothing to sell. Then they make, in my view, the biggest mistake, which is they start cross-selling. Your mindset is more about Let's help build a business based on a subscription model that you can one day sell 100% of it. My goal is to coach people on how to build a valuable business that they can have a liquidity event, a multi-million dollar exit from. My guest today is John Warlow, who's written a few books, one of them being a book I read in 2012 titled Built to Sell that I've recommended to any entrepreneur out there. He's also written The Automatic Customer, creating a subscription business in, any in business in any industry. He's also written The Art of Selling Your Business, Winning Strategies and Secret Hacks for Exiting on Top. He has studied, I don't know the number, I saw 55,000 businesses that he's analyzed and he gives them a certain score or value score, or value builder score of 90 or greater that are worth double the average performing businesses. We're going to get into that today. So with that being said, John, thank you so much for being a guest on Value Team. It's great to be here, Patrick. Okay, so John, let's 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 get right into it before we get into these books here. Your background, what gives you the moral authority, the credibility to be able to say that you can decide what company is going to sell at the highest possible valuation? Tell us. Yeah, I lived it uh, the other side. I made all the mistakes. I, I used to run a research company. Got a quantitative market research business that we built up to five or six million in revenue. And I, we had great clients. We worked with Microsoft and JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America. And someone had told me through the years that, you know, your client list is going to be what really acquirers are going to want to get after, right? Yeah. Your profit, your client list. So we had a great client list, profitable business. And I walked into a guy named Perry Miele's office in Toronto. Perry is uh, uh, an older statesman. He's an m and professional. And I said, you know, what do you think it's worth? And I was kind of rubbing my hands together. And he said, it kind of depends on the answer to a couple of questions. And I'm like, shoot. It's like, all right. So who does the research? And I'm like, well, I'm involved in some of the research, you know, like it's big companies. I got to be, well, who does the selling? I got to do some of the selling. It's Bank of America. It's JP Morgan Chase, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, John, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but I can't sell your company. There's, there's nothing to sell. Wow. It's worthless. And, and for me, that was like getting winded, right? Punched in the stomach. I, I walked into his office, rubbing my hands together, thinking I was sitting on this multi-million dollar business. And I was leaving his office realizing that I had made all the mistakes that there were to make in building a business. I was you know, it was about my, me. And so that took uh, years to transform. We made it into a, a subscription-based business. Uh, we, we got me out of doing the selling, out of doing the research. Ultimately, it was acquired by a New York Stock Exchange listed company. So it, it had a happy ending. But for me, that kicked off a journey, Pat, that was like a 20-year odyssey I've been on to really understand what drives the value of a company beyond just the typical things that we think, what it is that acquires value and care about. And, and what are they? I mean, I, I, I have your value builder system, which I love what you have here. Uh, but, uh, and, and I've gone through the process of both selling and raising money, whether it's dealing with private equity guys or investment banker side, and they're coming in and they're looking at, Hey, I want to sell the business and what's it going to look like? And it's not going to come with me or it's going to come with me. What's your replacement? Who do you have on your team? All these questions that come up. But for you, you have a systematized. If you don't mind taking a moment and give us that idea of how one goes about increasing the value of their company. Yeah, look, there are eight unique factors that I think acquirers care about. Probably the first step is to figure out one thing that you can do better than anybody else, one offering, one product or service that you can do better than anybody else. Because here's the thing, when, and you know this, Pat, but I'm, I'm talking to your listeners by extension, when an acquirer looks at buying a business, they're going to shake your hand and smile and tell you all wonderful things about your business. Then they're going to go and they're going to close the boardroom door. You will not be invited into the room. And they're going to turn to their colleagues and say, should we buy this company or should we compete with it? 
And they're going to compete with you if you built a business based on Me Too products, commoditized services, things that they can do easily and compete with you by lowering the price. And if they do agree to buy you, it'll be for the absolute rock bottom multiple because they know they can just win all your business by lowering the price. The decision they make when they say, we're going to buy this business yeah. is if it would cost them too long and too much money to try to build what you've created. And that you know, Warren Buffett talks about a competitive moat, right? Likes to invest in businesses with that deep and wide competitive moat. Those businesses are acquirable because you've got pricing authority and you can create the, the virtuous cycle that comes with pricing authority, higher margins, et cetera. So I think it really, it comes down to finding the one thing that you can dominate. One thing that you can dominate. Okay. So let's just say I found the one thing that I can dominate. So Essentially, what you're talking about is find your own blue ocean. Don't try to compete in 15 different places. Look at the, yesterday, I'm talking to Gary Kasparov, and he told me something very interesting. Gary Kasparov, the, they call him the goat of, uh, 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 what do you call it, chess. He was number one for 251 months. And one of the things he talks about is knowing your advantages is important, but it's also important knowing how to conceal your disadvantages, right? So you don't want the market to know your disadvantages. Are you pretty much talking about finding your own blue ocean that nobody else is doing? That's the number one? Absolutely. And here's the thing. A lot of business owners start off doing exactly that. They have an idea, they have a, a concept that they want to do, and they, and they start off and they, they become successful in the early days. Then they make, in my view, the biggest mistake, which is they start cross-selling. Somebody tells them some book, they go to some conference and they hear that it's eight times easier and cheaper to cross sell an existing customer, new product, new service than it is to go find new customers. And that's the moment where they start to fall off in terms of value. Because again, acquirers don't want, like when you buy cable television, you don't want the 200 channels. If you could deep couple it and just buy ESPN or just buy the MLB network, you would. And that's why those channels have become so dominant because we've been held hostage to buying all this stuff. Acquirers is just the same way. They want to buy one thing. I'll give you an example of how this kind of happened to one. of. I, I do a podcast called Built This Out Radio. I interviewed a woman named Stephanie Breedlove who built a company, sold it. And she told me about a, a kind of fork in the road she got to at $300,000 of annual revenue. She was in a funny business. She did payroll for parents who have a nanny to pay. So you've got kids, you probably have a nanny, you probably kind of find that the paying that nanny frustrating. Right? If you want to pay them legit. It's a niche. What's that? It's a niche. It's a great niche, yeah. right? But here's the thing. She reached $300,000 in sales, one employee. Okay. So it's her and one employee very early. Right. And the fork in the road is it's becoming harder for her to find parents who have a nanny to pay. So she's got two choices. She can go cross sell her existing customers, another service, Busy parents, two incomes, two you know kids. They need meal delivery and they need snow removal. They need lawn care, right? Lots of other services. Or she could take the much more difficult road and just go find more parents that have a nanny to pay. And everybody was chirping in her ear at the time that it was going to be a lot easier to cross sell her existing companies. And if she had, was focused on revenue as her ultimate goal, then she probably would have taken that route. And it would have been a disaster because ultimately she built a relatively slow growth company. It took her 25 years to get to $9 million in revenue. This is not like Google's now, no this is 25 years. But it's majority of America small businesses. So you're talking to Absolutely. majority of America. That's the backbone of America. Please continue. Exactly. She gets to $9 million in revenue, 10,000 customers. She decides she wants to sell. And she goes to care.com. Care.com is like the Angie's list of care providers. Plug in your zip code and it'll give you yep. babysitters rated five star in your local market. At the time, they had 7 million subscribers, 7 million parents who have a nanny to pay. So Breedlove went to them and said, look, 1% of your 7 million buy my payroll service, that's 70,000 customers, right? We got 10,000 customers today. That's 70,000 customers. Long story short, she sold her little $9 million business for $54 million. Care.com would never have purchased that business had Breedlove made the mistake of cross-selling her existing customers a new service because it would have watered down what she was doing. She doubled down on her niche. And that's, I think, one of the most important things we do is, is once we pick the one thing, the blue ocean, to yep. use your term, yep. 
avoiding the temptation to start cross-selling our customers other things because it just redoubles our point of differentiation if we focus on it for a long period of time. John, how does the entrepreneur, the founder, prevent themselves from being tempted to want to sell other products through their system to their existing customers? And, and if they are being tempted, why, why is this not a good thing to do? You know, you hear a lot of people nowadays, well, I don't know if you've read the book, Multiple Streams of Income. Isn't it great that you can sell 19 products to the same existing customers? So to some people who read certain books and these motivational guys say, you should go sell your clients, you know, additional products. Why should the entrepreneur and the founder stay disciplined <laughs> in that moment when someone says, this could make you an additional $100,000 a month? Yeah, great question. And it comes down to what your goal is. If you want income, if you want just profits, short-term profits, then yeah, go cross-sell your existing customers all day long. If you want to build a valuable business, cross-selling is one of the first ways to undermine the value of that business. Again, it depends on your goal. If you want to create a lifestyle business, you want to have profits coming in and you want to buy the car, you want to buy the, the house and you want to live for today, how about it? Go cross sell your existing customers. My goal is to coach people on how to build a valuable business that they can have a liquidity event, a multi-million dollar exit from. I'll give you an example because I think it, it, it serves to illustrate, I think, the point. I, uh, I, was, I had an, an interesting kind of 48-hour period where I did an interview with a guy who built a $15 million business, largely cross-selling an existing install bench base, a, a bunch of different products. I won't say the name of the company because I don't think he'd want me to share it. He then went on and sold that business because he was it was a diluted bunch of products that he'd been cross-selling, that they weren't differentiated. He sold his $15 million business for 25% of revenue, for 25% of one year's revenue. The next day, I interviewed a guy named Rob Walling. Rob Walling built a company called Drip. He built this little automatic marketing automation software up to $2 million in revenue, like one eighth of the size of the other guy the day before. Yet he was looking at offers of between nine and 12 times top line revenue. Not EBITDA. Not EBITDA. So guy chasing revenue is getting 25% of one year's revenue. The guy focused on building a valuable company is looking at offers of a multiple of revenue, in this case, a double digit multiple of revenue. That's what I'm talking about. When you have the focus on building a valuable company rather than a lifestyle business with income streams, it's a completely different yep. frame of mind. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a decision we all need to make. You, you, you either want to make profit and cash today, mm -hmm. fair enough, or build for the long term. Yeah, that's a great point. You, you, you know, had a guy named Bobby. One day we're having dinner together at uh, Steakhouse Flemings in uh, Topanga. And he's working for his lawyer. And this Bobby guy is making $300,000. Yes, I said, how's it working for this lawyer, this law firm? He said, every month, anything that we made in profits, he would take it out and put in his checking account. I said, what's the guy's vision? What does he want to build? He says, nothing. He just takes profit. I said, have you ever asked him what his vision is? He says, Pat, I'm telling you, his vision is he just wants to take the cash out and put in his checking account. I said, doesn't want to build the biggest law firm, maybe biggest regional, biggest. Nope, nothing like this. So how's it feel working for a guy like that? He said, I'm looking for other jobs. So sometimes when you're also in the profit mode, people who are aspirational, they're sitting there saying, well, what do I do with this thing here long term? What if I want to get a piece of equity? What if I want to you know, help take it to the next level? Why am I doing it if it's just profit sharing? Because a lot of times that legacy model also has a hard time retaining high quality talent. Yes, you may keep your son, your daughter, your cousin, your nephew, your best friend's brother and things like that. But it's different to keep uh, to both attract and retain high quality talent. But going back to question, we talked about selling your company. So curious to know if you even have the answer to this question, what your perspective would be. So the thinking of a uh, uh, not necessarily the okay. So let's just talk about the investment banker. So this is you. You're thinking about selling your business. You go to a banker, a broker, whatever you want to call it, who's from your industry. Before we go think about the buyer, I want you to first give us the perspective of how does an investment banker evalu evaluate your business or value you to say, is this a business worth me taking to the market to talk to buyers? What do they ask? What do they want to know before they filter out here? I understand you said the one product. I understand you said the one differentiator. I've had many different investment bankers and I have different thoughts, but I want to hear it from you. 
What are they thinking about before they say, I'm willing to represent you to sell your business because I'm confident we're going to get a check? How are they thinking? Yeah, it depends on the size of the company. If it's a very small business, say less than a million in sales, that banker is like a likely a business broker. And they want to know what you want for your company. And if your expectations are too lofty, they're going to say it's it's going to take too much time. If your business is between one and 10 million in annual revenue, maybe two and 20, something in that nature, neighborhood, the natural buyer for those businesses right now is a private equity group. They've come way down market and they're starting to look at that type of business. And, and I think the MA uh, like the M&A pr professional wants to get a deal done. And so they're going to look at you and say, are you willing to sell to a private equity group? And the key determinant there is, are you willing to carry equity? Meaning, are you willing to sell 60% and carry 40? And if the answer is no, I want out 100%, they're going to be like, I don't think I can get that deal done. Can you go a little bit deeper on that? Go a little deeper on that. So why, why does the buyer, so the broker, the investment banker in the middle that you're talking about two to $20 million, why does he want to convince the entrepreneur, the founder to say, look, if you carry 40%, the benefit of it is dot, dot, dot. What are the benefits of it? Well, so the benefit for the M&A professionals, they can get a deal done because private equity companies, the way they're structured is they don't have managers. When you sell your company to a private equity group, typically you have to carry some equity and continue to run your business as a as, a, as an executive in the new in the new co they, they're forming. And so they need you to stick around. The way they do that is get you to carry some equity. And so if you're not willing to carry equity, it's unlikely that a private equity group is going to want to buy you unless there's some platform that they're you know gonna you know latch you into. So you know, and that can, you know, that has some upsides and it has some downsides. Upsides is what they refer to as the second bite of the apple. It's a terribly overused expression, but basically it means that you sell your first tranche of equity, 60%, let's say at, at X multiple. And then downstream, because of the professionalism of the private equity group, the fact that you they lace you together with other businesses, that the second tranche of your equity, that 40%, actually gets up being worth more because the private equity group has sort of professionalized your business. That's the pitch, at least. The downside of that pitch is that you, when you do that deal, become a minority shareholder in that business and you no longer control it. I, I, I interviewed a guy named Ryan Moran and Ryan built a company, $18 million in revenue, sold it. 60% to a private equity group, he decided to carry 40%. He was kind of done, didn't want to run it anymore. So the private equity group brought in a CEO. CEO didn't really know the business, the industry, the company starts to falter. So much so that the company starts to fail at paying down the debt the private equity company took on to buy the business. The bank yanked the line, the company went bankrupt, his 40% went to zero. And he, there was nothing he could do about it because he's the minority yep. shareholder in a business that he had mostly sold. So that's the pro quo. There's a, there's a huge upside if you get it right. There's a significant downside if you get it wrong. Okay. So, so far we went from the perspective of the, the broker. And by the way, do you have a number when it's above $100 million on how the investment bankers work when it's above $100 million revenue? Yeah, you're, you're largely looking at either either a very large private equity group or a strategic investor, right? Because that's the third type that we didn't talk about. We talked about individual investors, very small companies, private equity groups, you know, two plus. Uh, and then there's different styles of private equity group. And then there's very large companies that buy companies for strategic reasons. And strategic acquisitions are when you have some strategic reason to buy the business. I remember uh, I interviewed a guy who started the business blinds.com. Have you ever, have you ever heard no. of these guys? Blinds.com, great business. Uh, he started it right around the time that uh, the guy's name is Jim Stanfield. Uh, I think it's Jim Stanfield. I'm getting it right. He started it around the time that Bezos was starting to sell books on Amazon, right? And he's like, well, if Bezos can sell books, I can sell blinds because his wife had a blind store, window coverings, you know, his name is Jay Steinfeld, by the way. And Jay, you know, the challenge with blinds that are different than books is that blinds are complicated, right? You got to measure them. You got to pick the colors. You got to install them. Like there's lots of more complications than just selling a book. So it took him a lot longer to build his company, but he did build it up. He got it up to more than $100 million in annual sales over a 30-year run. And they were dominating the blinds category. And so along comes Home Depot. They're a strategic acquirer, obviously, right? Home Depot had two problems. The first one is obvious. 
they were having their lunch eaten by blinds.com. They were not number one in the blinds category. They want to be number one in every category they sell in the store, right? So number one, they're they're getting they're out, out being out competed. The second though problem was much more hidden, but ultimately much more valuable for Jay Steinfeld. Home Depot at the time had ninety billion dollars of revenue. Yet the vast majority of that revenue was done through a bricks and mortar store. Mm. They were having all kinds of trouble getting people to go to homedepot.com and buying things online. And you know what bricks and mortar, you know, cost base are. You got employees, you got real estate. I mean, it's a much more expensive model than if you could get the people to just go to a website. And along comes this guy named Jay Steinfeld, who's number one, dominating the blinds category, but number two, has figured out the secret sauce. For, in, for selling complicated products that need to be installed online. What does Home Depot have? They have $90 billion worth of stuff complicated that need to be installed. And so Home Depot bought Jay's company for number one to, to get number one in the blinds category, but also because they wanted to graft his expertise, his knowledge of how to sell complicated things across $90 billion worth of revenue. Yep. That's a strategic acquisition. Right, it's not just a financial engineering, which is what most private equity groups do. They had a strategic reason to buy Blinds.com. That's a that's a great. By the way, did Jay end up becoming anybody at Home Depot, or he stayed as the CEO of Blinds? Uh, it's funny. I interviewed him. He just left uh, Home Depot, but he did stick around for a while. Actually, okay. I think he was Got there it. for four or five years. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So it must yeah. have been it must have been a back end. He probably had some, uh, you know, earn out or something that he had to do on the back end. Maybe a different. Uh, uh, check that he was going to get as well. But if if we go back to what you're saying here, so we have, I want to get an analogy so the audience can kind of get this because this question is typically asked by smaller business owners that are doing million, five million, 10 million, and they want to sell their business. So the seller, you, you are the owner of a house. The realtor is the investment banker or the broker. <laughs> the buyer is the person that wants to buy your house, right? That's example of somebody wanting to buy your business 100%. Now, on the buy side, say me, I don't want to sell 100%. Say I want to go raise money. I can get passive money. I can get uh, active money. I can get uh, a, a strategic partner or as a passive guy that's just giving me the money. Hey, I had a guy who was sitting down with, he sold uh, one of his businesses for $1.6 billion. His father did in the insurance business. He was one of three kids. He got a half a billion of it when his father died. He's been in the insurance business 30 years. He said, I'll give you $5 million, but I don't want you to call me. I don't want a board seat. I want nothing. I just know this works. I want you to give me results every 90 days and maybe send me an email once a month. I said, that's not a fit for me. So when somebody is looking for a strategic partner to come in, maybe you're going to sell 20% equity, maybe 30%, maybe 15%. What are some things the entrepreneur and the founder needs to be considering with the strategic or questions to be asking before saying, yeah, I kind of want you to be my strategic investor here. And when you say strategic investor, your definition is low touch, uh, someone who's not like the example that you're, you're providing. I'm, I'm talking about more from the standpoint of, look, I'm going to come in, I'll get a board seat. I will use my contacts and my relationships mm. to help you go get uh, a new partner, a new vendor, a better technology. I offer X, Y, Z to you based on my Rolodex. That's kind of what I mean, where I'm willing to have him become an investor Got because it. it's worth me giving up 20% of my company to this guy for the amount of money he's buying because he's going to bring me additional things. Yeah, tread carefully is what I would say. Uh, I just did an interview with uh, a couple who sold 15% of their business to one of the sharks, Robert Herchevec, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. And that's the kind of deal, right? He's a smart guy, great network. And he you know, did 15%. They uh, sold him the 15% and never actually spoke with him to my knowledge after that. I asked them like, what was it like on the, on the podcast? I said, what was it like to work with Robert? And like, you know, and they're like, well, we actually didn't talk to him after that. And so again, you could say, well, that's fine. And Robert gave the money as he promised he would. And, and you know, that was what they were raising. They were raising money. And it's hard to put uh, a value on or put like a fence around the advice piece, right? Like how, how do you 
objectively measure how much advice the person is going to bring. So I think you you want to really tread carefully there because it's hard to you know measure that. I think you see that a lot with private equity groups as well. The private equity groups wear a nice suit, they went to the right schools, they rock up and they say, "Hey, we've got all this expertise, we understand your industry." And I'd push a little bit there. Uh, you know, it's funny. I I uh, when I sold my last company, uh, we ultimately sold to a strategic, as I mentioned, but we also looked at selling to private equity. And we did research for B2B research. Uh, so very large financial services companies, technology companies, and tele telephony companies. Those are the three categories that, that bought what we sold. And I did this you know, dog and pony show and talked to a few private equity groups. One private equity group you know, was trying to make the pitch that we should sell to them. And I said, so what are you going to bring to the table beyond money? And, and they said, oh, expertise. We've got lots of ideas on how to build your business. I'm like, oh, interesting. So like, shoot, give me one. And they're like, well, we think that, you know, I know you market to a lot of like large enterprise organizations, but I think you should sell to the Toronto Maple Leafs organization. And I was like, the Toronto, like the hockey team. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, they have lots of small businesses. They, like, it was the most asinine idea that you could possibly conceive of. I'd been running the business for 10 years. I knew exactly who the target customers were. I'd spent 10 years thinking about it. And here they were, they went to the right MBA, they got the right school, they had the right suit. And they thought that they were going to like impress us with that idea. And so, look, I don't mean to discount the entire private equity group or, or you know, the, the whole population, but I would certainly push hard for examples, you know, specific tactical examples of what somebody thinks they can bring to the table for your business. Because guess what? If you've been running your business for 10 years, you probably know it better than anybody else. And while they may have some other experience to bring, I think it's worth vetting that. So based on what I'm hearing from you the last 15 minutes is you're not a fan of selling uh, a 60% and letting 40% ride. And you're not a big fan of bringing a private equity guy or a person up front that may buy 10, 15, 20 points because you don't necessarily know if they're going to be involved or if they're really going to be uh, bringing value to the company. Your mindset is more about Let's help build the business based on a subscription model that you can one day sell 100% of it. Am I reading that correctly or am I way off? You're absolutely right. I'm not saying never sell to a private equity, never sell 15%. I'm saying be skeptical. There are a lot of sharks out there and there are a That's lot fair. of very yeah. slick people, a lot of slick people who will tell you what you want to hear. Yep. What I think most entrepreneurs want is freedom. You know, we talked freedom offline. And I think most people, when you push them on why they become entrepreneurs, it's not because they want to become the next Elon Musk. It's because they crave in their gut at the most visceral level possible freedom. And you give that up when you take equity from a private equity group. You give that up when you bring on an investor, a brand name investor who wants to tell you how to run your company. And I believe entrepreneurs add the most value when they control their destiny. And for a lot of things, I think it's better that they sell and they move on. Stephanie Breedlove didn't go work for care.com for 20 years, right? She built an amazing company. She got a great multiple and she left. And I, think, I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of yeah. in that. Equally, I think Jay Steinfeld built an amazing company. He helped in the transition and then he left. And, and I think that's admirable. And I think most entrepreneurs, if you push them, their primary motivation, even in many cases, even isn't just money, it's freedom. And you give that up when you sell uh, to somebody other than a strategic, in my view. You give that up when you sell that to someone other than a strategic. When you sell your business, a part of your business to, to anybody sense. other than a strategic. That yeah. makes sense. So, okay. So for, for, uh, 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 okay. So do you mind if I push that a little bit and unpack that? Yeah. Is that okay with you? Okay. So uh, uh, on one end, I think what you're talking about is, okay, Jobs lost the board. The board fired him. He brought Scully in first time around. They fired him. He left. He did Pixar. He got Disney to buy Pixar. He became the biggest shareholder of Disney before they, he died. And then he came back in and they brought him back into Apple. And he was a 0.6% shareholder of Apple. You know, obviously he sold, he was offended. So he sold a ton of his shares. I've interviewed Steve Wozniak before, and we've had a good time together. On the flip side of it, a Bezos sells off 20% of his company right off the bat. 
I think he goes and gets $50,000 from 40 different people. And then later on, he ends up becoming a 16% owner of the company, similar to an Elon Musk, 16% owner of the company. And it ends up succeeding for him and them. So what is the difference between, I, I hear the horror stories. I've been around the block for a long time. I've heard the horror stories. They suck. You're miserable. You feel handcuffed. You go from one day being an entrepreneur to the next day, you're an employee. And this is not what you signed up for. That's exactly what you didn't want to do. You're back to being an employee again. You're miserable. Conflict, the board, you and, I are, you and them are fighting. You don't want to show up to this. You're just acting like it's just, it's ugly. It's very ugly. Everyone's unhappy. Personal life is unhappy. People are sick and tired of you guys bitching at each other. Not a good situation, right? But in some of these cases, they work. In those that do, what makes that work? I think you raised some great examples of Musk and, and, and Bezos and, and Jobs. I think it's about understanding your psychographics. Psychographics is the study of human motivation. And we've done a bunch of research into what motivates small, medium-sized business owners. And we've discovered there are three psychographic profiles. We call them mountain climbers, freedom fighters, and craftspeople. Mountain climbers are people like Jobs, Wozniak, uh, you know, Bezos, who are trying to build something and their greatest motivation is the challenge associated with it. I mean, you can see it with Branson and they're all going into space. I mean, it's the, it's the challenge of doing it. They don't need the money. They don't need to go to space. They yeah. want the challenge. And so they go to the, the highest peak and they literally look around the, the horizon looking for the next highest peak. And so for them, they pray at the, at, the, at the altar of revenue, right? Because revenue is the ultimate arbiter of size and importance, right? So that's a, that's a mountain climber, right? The second group is a freedom fighter and their primary motivation is independence. They're motivated by FU money, right? The ability to decide when to work, for who to work, what to do. They don't want to be the next Jeff Bezos, right? They want control over their destiny and they're freedom fighters. And the third group are craftspeople and they want to master their craft. They're the, the lawn care specialists who, who you can impress and ingratiate yourself with by just, just talking about how well they cut the lawn or the, you know, the, the copywriter, the massage therapist. They are motivated by mastery, not building a business, by having a craft, mm. right? Those three types of entrepreneurs. And I think the majority of employer-based companies, meaning not just the owner, but at least one employee, the vast majority of them are freedom fighters, statistically, quantitatively, the vast, vast, vast majority. I would agree. It's, it's only a very small slice who are truly mountain climbers. Yeah. If you are a true mountain climber and for you, and, here's, and here is where the rubber meets the road before I go further, there's an inflection point in virtually every growth oriented business. And that is that the, the, the company runs out of money if it's growing fast enough, sure. right? And when that happens, you have one of two roads to ch choose from, right? Option A is you sell some equity, you give up a little bit to, you know, as Bezos did to 50 uh, you know, people in order to continue to fund growth or you throttle back growth in order to contain 100% ownership. And when a freedom fighter reaches that fork in the road, the decision they make nine out of 10 times is to throttle back. Sure. So if you reach the fork in the road and you're willing to give up some independence, as Bezos did, as Jobs did, et cetera, in return for growth, you're probably a mountain climber. You'd probably be happy taking on equity, et cetera. I think the tragedy, and you've seen it and you describe it in your comments, I think the tragedy is when you have a freedom fighter take outside money and they think they want to grow revenue, but what they really want is independence. How does, a freedom, fighter, how does a freedom fighter know how to be true to themselves in cases like this? Because you're living in, a, in an era where you're being compared to, because the mountain climber, you don't need to tell the mountain climber. The mountain climber knows I'm not like anybody else. Yeah, I'm not wired like the freedom. They, they don't need to be sold that they're a mountain climber. You kind of have to you almost have to try to convince the mountain climber, listen, Johnny, enjoy the process. This whole right. thing is not about you go just try to enjoy the process. What a freedom guy is more like, look, is it really worth it? Why am I freaking doing this? I don't want to work Saturdays. I don't want to work. So you can tell that. But how do you get the freedom guy to realize, listen, you just may not be the mountain climber that's willing to pay the price at levels that you're nothing wrong with that. How do you get that person to understand that? I think it's 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 asking themselves the 
the question, if you had to give up equity in return to reach the goals that you have for your business, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to give up control in return for achieving the goals you've stated? If the answer is yes, then they're probably a mountain climber. If I think most of the time, the answer will be no. And if they're honest about it, it. you know, once you sell a tranche of your equity, your company is on a, a one-way track to be sold because you have to get a return for that investor, right? So like the moment you take, even if it's five points, 10%, 20%, the, the clock is ticking between the time you have to sell your company. And, and so I think that really is really important for people to hear because again, you owe it to your investor to get them a return. And to do that, you need to get liquid. Makes sense. By the way, I love the whole uh, mountain climber, freedom fighter and craftspeople. Mountain climber, they, you know, they want a challenge of doing something that's never been done before type of mentality. Freedom is their few money. Craft is I want to master what I'm doing, a specialized type of a skill. So let's go to a different side here. Again, on this topic, before we go to the next part is, you know, uh, uh, selling to a strategic, selling to private equity. Okay. Selling to private equity. Is it fair to say that a private equity uh, thinking, and maybe you'll, you'll add additional things to this, uh, a private equity guy or gal wants to buy at 8 to 12x and they want to sell later on at 15x. Uh, and that's what their formula is. I'm a name. I'll come in. I'll buy you at 11. I'm going to sell you at 15. And you're going to go grow another 30% for the next three years. I'm going to be able to sell you at four times the valuation I bought you at. Is private equity purely mathematics? Is it purely math? Depends on, on the type. Yes, they're in the buy low, sell high game. So they're trying to buy you as low as possible. They're going to use a lot of debt. So they don't put a lot of money into the deal. They use debt. So their return on investment, if it works out successfully, is very, very, very high. So they're going to buy low and sell high. That's, there's a, there's a, as a hybrid private equity group that I would characterize as somewhere between a private equity group and a strategic. And a hybrid is, is usually rolling up an industry. And so they get a kicker. So let me give you an example. There's a, there's a private equity group right now rolling up dental practices. And so they're buying the dental practices at X multiple and they're rolling them all together and they're going to sell down, down the road. Now, because they're rolling these, private, these uh, dental practices together, they're enjoying some synergies. So you don't need five head office people if you, have, if you buy five dental practices. You probably only need one head office person. You probably don't need a reception. You can get away with, et cetera. So you're getting to, get, to eliminate some of the overhead costs. So that's one way they win. The second way they win is buying power. All of the big you know, OEM manufacturers of dental equipment, so whether it's the lights or the chairs, give rebates and discounts based on volume, right? So if you've got one dental practice and you want to buy a $2,000 light, you pay retail for that, right? If you've got 1,000 dental practices and you want to buy a light for every one of your practices, you pay a much, much, much lower price. And so, look, they, they have lots of different ways to make money. One is buy low, sell high. Two is use debt in order to leverage up, just like buying a house, leverage up your return if the asset goes up in value. Three is stripping out some of the, the costs associated with, uh, with running two businesses in the same industry. And four is getting rebates or discounts based on volume. And so, it's a really attractive business model if, if you buy low enough and can sell high enough. Yeah, and that's happened a lot. By the way, that's happened in a lot of different industries. The industry is just oh. one of them. I mean, it's happening in every industry. It's happening in ours right now where guys are going around picking them up left and right. And they're saying, look, you're doing 10 million a year. At 10 million, you probably don't have a CFO. You may have a COO. Maybe you got a VP of finance. Maybe a controller, but you don't have a CFO 220. Let me provide that CFO service for you. So we'll save you XYZ money. You don't have to worry about getting a general counsel. I will use my law firm and are you going to be able to save me that? And, and they're doing that and they're picking them up at seven to nine in our field. And then they're pulling them together. Then they have a leverage against the bigger insurance company. Now the bigger insurance companies are worried because if they make one decision, so essentially these guys are controlling the bigger insurance company and the insurance companies are shivering. So I'm seeing a lot of that happening. I'm sure you've seen it as well in many different industries. So let's transition into a value builder, value builder. Would you mind taking a minute and breaking down your system of value builder? I know you got 12 modules. I have it sitting here right in front of me. If you don't mind just taking a moment and explaining how that works for you. Yeah, so value builder is practice management software for business advisors. 
and business advisors being coaches, consultants, M&A professionals, business brokers who use the system as a way to start the exit conversation with business owners. And for those that are interested, build the value of those companies. Typical company that starts with, with value builder, a typical business that uses, we, we have an intake questionnaire, like an assessment questionnaire. The average score is 59 out of a possible 100. Those businesses, when they trade, are trading at around 3.5 times pre-tax profit. Those companies that come in, they learn about the eight key drivers of value and improve their score up to 90 or greater. So these are sort of our best in class provider, you know, businesses, they're getting offers of 7.1 times pre-tax profit or about double the average performing business. And so we have a, a whole network uh, of advisors around the world who offer the value builder system to their clients as a way to build the value of, of their business. You mind if I go through some of the modules here with you so the audience can kind of hear it? Yeah, so sure thing. The, the first one we got is uh, benchmark where you're at. Module two, scalability finder, construct a durable platform for growth. Then it's customer score, capture the voice of your customer, okay? Three is growth potential. Four is recurring revenue, which I wanna come back to that. Five is monopoly control, which I'm curious to know what that means. Seven is, uh, I'm sorry, that was six. Seven is hub and spoke, break free of the day-to-day -day operations of your business. Eight is Switzerland structure, Stre strengthen the foundation of your company. Nine is customer score. Uh, 10 is valuation teeter totter, boost your cash flow. And then 11 is the shortlist builder, pinpoint a list of your strategic buyers, makes sense. And then 12 is the envelope test, decide when to sell. Let's go back to recurring revenue and monopoly control. Can you give me examples of industries that are typically transaction based type of industries, how they can make it recurring? I'll throw some of them out there and see where your mind's going to go to. If you've dealt with 55,000 businesses you've analyzed, I'm sure you have experience in almost every industry. So real estate, mortgages, real estate and loans are typically transaction-based, right? Hey, we sold the house, 6%, 3-3, million dollars, $30,000, 80%, $24,000, 20%. We make our, you know, $6,000. We're happy to go. We do a hundred of those, you know, we're making money, et cetera, et cetera. How does a real estate or a mortgage shop, from your experience, create a recurring revenue to help increase their valuation? Yeah, that's a really, really, really unique example and a really tough one. And so some of the models, the recurring revenue models, need you to go outside of your comfort zone, right? I mean, you, you want to talk about uh, like a software product, you can turn it on a SaaS, that's easy. easy. Yeah. Real estate is really, really tough. I think you have to ask yourself, what is your expertise and how do you create a membership organization around that? So if you've got a specialty in selling $5 million homes, that's probably a nuanced service. That's probably some unique skill set that you have that you could create a mastermind organization around of other people in other markets that do exactly that, sell $5 million homes. And so you're offering a mastermind access to that on a recurring basis. So for $1,000 a month, you can be part of my mastermind. There's an example of where you're going way outside of what you do every day, which is sell houses, but you're basically meant you taking your expertise and you're turning it into a subscription model. I mean, that's, that's probably, you picked on probably one of the toughest ones yep. and, and one that requires the biggest leap of, of, the, of what you do every day. I mean, there's, there's lots of other industries that, that are going through this kind of metamorphosis I had an, an interesting one the, the other day where I, I had a chance to speak to the Car Wash Association. So these are guys who have car washes. You remember the, the old days we used to, you know, you, it was transactional, right? You, yep. you get a tank of gas, you get a car wash. Yep. Well, as you may know, they're all in the midst of transitioning to recurring revenue, all you can eat subscription-based car washes. So now you're in Fort Lauderdale, there's dozens of car washes where you can pay $30 a month and you can go any day of the week. There's no extra charge. It's unlimited car washes. It's a subscription model. And that change, you may say, well, why would they do that? Well, it's making those companies much, much more valuable because of acquirers value subscription revenue, recurring revenue, not transactional revenue, at least not to the same extent. So that's, a, that's an industry that's being completely changed as we speak to become more recurring revenue. But the real estate one's a, a more challenging one, but, but certainly there'd be, there'd be examples of ways you could do it. What would you do? I mean, you know that space pretty well. well I mean, I look at Gary Keller. Gary Keller took a Keller Williams. I'm not even in the business, but he took it 
and he got it to 190,000 associates, realtors, I think, uh, you know, worldwide. They've done a great job. They're killing it right now. And their model isn't necessarily a subscription model. Their model is a replacement model. So you get started with them. You give up, I think, the first three sales to the other realtor that's training you. And then you open up your franchise. You're paying rent to the cubicles. It is a very different kind of a model that they have, but it's hard to do on real estate. I got another guy named Barry uh, Habibs who on the real estate side, he created a software. He creates content for us. He created a software that uh, dictates an exact uh, value of the house you're buying today, 12 months from now, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. So let's just say you go buy this house and XYZ zip code, they do an audit on the house and say the house is worth a half a million dollars, but the seller's uh, asking for 550. You don't want to pay 550 because the value today is 500. You may pay 550 because their formula says in three years, that's going to be a $700,000 house. I'll buy it. So they offer that for loan officers and realtors where they're presenting that to their clients. It's a very, it's a subscription type of model. I think it's got 20, 30,000 customers that are paying on a monthly basis. And that's one angle to take it. But straight realtor and loan officer, it's pretty hard to do. What the brokers will do is they will, create a, a broker fee per loan that's being funded that the LO pays. So if I fund a loan that's going to pay $10,000 a commission, no matter what the loan is, you give me a $900 processing fee. So a lot of these brokers are making money off their processing fee, but that still is not a fully a recurring model that we're talking about. Yeah. I describe that as reoccurring versus recurring. Very big difference. And the difference reoccurring is like a rash. It comes back. You never know yep. when it's going to come back. Yep. Recurring is a predictable cadence. By, by the way, question for you. What is the difference between a car wash having 30,000 customers? Let's pick a number, 30,000. The average car wash gets how many customers a day? Is it fair to say 100? Let's just say it's a good size, gets 100. Depends if it's May or November in Toronto. <laughs> so so let's let's use 100, okay? So sure. let's say 100 times 30 is what? 3,000, right? Let's just say 3,000 is the number here. So you got two car washes. One of them gets 3,000 car washes no matter what happens, and they're paying whatever they're paying. The other one has 3,000 members that are paying 30 bucks a month. Revenue is identical, identical revenue, Okay. One just knows people are going to show up because he's on the right corner. The other one is, I got members, man. They're going to pay me this money no matter what. How big of a difference is the valuation of the company with recurring versus revenue just coming in? Yeah, I think most acquirers will play a, a premium on the recurring revenue. I don't know what it is in car washes. I can tell you what it is in other industries. I mean, if you take, uh, let's take security, for example, uh, the home security where they wire up the sensors on your windows, yep. call the cops if there's a break-in. They have transactional revenue, which is the installation revenue that they charge to come and install the system in your house. And then they have recurring or subscription, what they call monitoring revenue, which is the 39 bucks a month we pay to monitor ADT, the system, whoever, ADT, ADT or yeah. Chubb or whoever you use. Typical choir today will pay about 75 cents for every dollar of installation revenue and $3 for every dollar of monitoring revenue. 75 cents per dollar of installation revenue, $3. $3 for every dollar of monitoring revenue. Said another way, your monitoring revenue, your recurring revenue is worth $4 for every dollar of installation revenue. So interesting. That makes sense. So And so that's the, I mean, that's, that's, that's the stakes that we're talking about. Like when we talk about, wouldn't it be nice to create recurring revenue? This is not a, 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 a little bump to the value of your company. This isn't a, like a nip and a tuck. This is transformational to the value of your business. No and that's why, you know, you, you, you throw out examples and people, you know, one of the things that, that happens a lot, I think, is when we talk recurring revenue, again, if you're in the media business, if you're in the software business, people go get it, understood it. Like we do, we've been doing that for years, right? But when you're in the manufacturing business or the distribution business or the real estate business or the legal business or the retail business, a lot of people just go, that's not for me. That's not the way our industry works is the most common reframe I hear. That's, you, just, you don't get our industry. And they kind of smile, right? And what I usually tell them is the story of H. Bloom. So do you know anything about H. Bloom? No, tell me. 
H Bloom is a business that got into the business of selling flowers, right? And if you know flowers, I mean, this is a crappy business model, right? Flowers, <laughs> the farmer cuts the flower off the stem, it starts to die immediately, right? Typical flower store in America throws out 60% of its inventory. Wow. Right? Why? Because it's dead, rotting in the refrigerator. Unbelievable. Right? Typical flower store in America throws out 60%. Seasonality, Mother's Day and Valentine's Day is when 30% of the flowers get purchased. 30%, two days. So you got 363 <laughs> days of the year to try and sell flowers, right? That? And how do you do wow. that? You sell flowers by, and so look, Mother's Day and Valentine's Day, great days, but then the rest of the year, you have to rent really expensive space at a retail corner, the concourse level of a bank tower, just to try to intercept some guy who's forgotten his you know, wedding anniversary to sell flowers. Right, so it's like it's a crappy business model on every dimension, right? They're going out of business all you know all, all over the place. These two guys, Brian Burkhart and Sandy Panda, came around, based New York based guys. They said we're going to get into the business of selling flowers, but we're going to do it differently. We're going to do it on subscription. And here's the thing that they did, which most people miss when it comes to transitioning a transaction business model into a recurring model. They didn't try to create subscriptions for anybody who buys flowers. They didn't try to look at Mother's Day and weddings and funerals and graduations. They said, no, who are all the people that buy flowers? And they looked at all the reasons people buy flowers. And there's one tiny segment of flower buyers that need them on a regular basis. And that segment is hotels. If you go down to the Four Seasons Hotel in Miami, you walk into the reception table, there will be a beautiful bouquet, a $200 bouquet of flowers, fresh cut flowers, because that gives the image that it's a five-star hotel. That manager of that hotel has better things to do than walk down to the flower store and buy a $200 bouquet of flowers. So H. Bloom figured this out. And they said, every two weeks, we're going to ship you a brand new bouquet of flowers. We'll get rid of the old flowers and we'll do that on subscription. The typical average lifetime value of an H Bloom subscriber is more than $4,500. You make one sale, <laughs> right? And you're going to get $4,500 worth of uh, revenue wow. from that customer. Right. And here's what that does, Pat. And I, again, I know you know this, but it changes the economics you of the business totally. Yeah. Now you can hire salespeople yep. to go call in hotels, yep. you give them an account, you give them a car, like totally changes the economics. Uh, and and, and the secret, again, if you're sitting here saying, how do I transform my business, my manufacturing company, my retail company, my distribution, whatever it is, into a recurring revenue, the secret is to not try to dilute and water down your offering by figuring out all of the, trying to come up with a recurring revenue for all your customers. The secret is to segment first and identify if there's a little segment in your customer base that for some reason needs what you sell regularly. That's the person you want to build out your subscription model for. So it's it sounds like I mean if you can figure out a way to get I mean this this is nothing new. The more you can figure out your niche and not trying to uh, be uh, the business that's for every customer, like the whole word holistic. I remember one time when I started my insurance company, I was sitting down with a guy in uh, uh, Pasadena at a sushi spot, and I said, "Tell me about your company's vision." He says, "Well, let me tell you what we want to do." We're going to be able to sell loans. We're going to be able to do this. We're going to be able to do mutual funds, stocks, bonds, money under management, RIA, PNC, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, life insurance, annuities. And he just kept going. He says, <laughs> we're going to be a holistic. I said, how the hell do you expect one salesperson to learn how to sell all that stuff? It's not that hard. I said, that's a lot of learning to do right there. He says, what's your vision? I said, we are going to specialize in selling life insurance and life only. That's all we're doing. He says, but you're serious seven, you're 66, you're 31, you're 26. I can sell futures, commodity stock. I can sell it. He says, nope, we're doing life only. And that's it. You're going to give up the health insurance money. Yes. You're going to give up the loan money. Yes. Fast forward from there. We got now 16,000 agents nationwide. We had a convention last week at Vegas with 10,000 in attendance with Mike Tyson, Nikki Jam, Mario Lopez, Sebastian Maniscalco, because we went niche. And what was so crazy about it is when we were sitting down with buyers and I had no clue what was going on. It's by the way, biggest credit goes to reading books like yours. I read your book in 2012 and I'm trying to, I read yours and I read the other one. There's two of you. 
One is built to sell. One is built to last. Is built to last Eric Reese, I think, and then your no built to last is Jim Collins. The, the, the not built to last then built to sell, and then there is a, a uh, the lean startup is Eric Reese. Lean startup. Lean startup. Lean startup. startup. Yeah. So I read all of I read like fifty of these books of startups simultaneously, and, and I draw something like, man, this guy makes sense. This guy makes sense. So as a person who doesn't have an MBA, as a person who doesn't have a four year degree, two year degree, I don't shadow a CEO or a founder. My source for guys like you who wrote your books, where I can lean on you for feedback to see how I need to uh, build my business. And I cannot even tell you what that did for our business. So for somebody that's watching this, if you haven't read, I can only speak on one book. All the other books, I'm sure if you, uh, uh, if Built to Sell was a great book for me, I'm sure the other ones as well. We're going to put the links below for all the books, but the one that made a big difference for me was Built to Sell. I think anybody that's not even thinking about selling their business should read this book. And I think anybody that's working for somebody that doesn't necessarily know how to prepare their company to sell them, maybe you're the CFO, CEO, I think you also need to read the business because you'll become a better value person to your partner. But last but not least, before we wrap up here and send you off, Switzerland structure, strengthen the foundation of your company. You're from Canada. Why are you giving a shout out to Switzerland? because <laughs> they're obsessed with independence. Okay. So tell right? like if you look at the country of Switzerland, it's, yeah. it's, I mean, if you're looking on a map, it's this tiny little blip right beside France, Germany, Italy. If anybody should be part of the European union and like be an active member in Europe, it would be Switzerland, but no, they don't even use the Euro currency, right? They didn't join the world wars. They didn't send troops to Iraq. Why? Because they want to remain independent. They want to be able to not cozy up to any one geopolitical faction because they want to be independent. And so we gave the name, the Switzerland structure to a company that is independent of any one customer, employee, or supplier. You can't have too much reliance on a single customer, supplier, or employee. And an employee, I think most people get customer concentration. Most people have heard. I think increasingly supplier dependence is also a big deal where an acquirer looks at you and said, you know, like an Amazon reseller right now, right? I, I did one where uh, I did one with a guy named Ben Leonard who built a company called Beast Gear. They did like straps for working out and like great business, but all on Amazon. And so when he went to sell it, one of the concerns that the acquirer had was, you know, what if Amazon delists you? What if they demote you in their search algorithm? If all of your revenue is Amazon related, it's a problem. I did another interview with a guy named Adi Pinar, who built a company, a checkout software and cart uh, abandonment software for Shopify. Well, Shopify, if you've looked at the stock, I mean, it's going through the roof, right? Mm -hmm. And all, you know, oh, yeah. all boats lift, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. And so he's like latched his cart onto a juggernaut, which is great. But then when he went to sell it, they're like, but what if Shopify creates their own cart abandonment software? You're out of business. And so any, any dependency on a single customer employee and increasingly supplier is a challenge for an acquirer. That's just powerful right there. By the way, the monopoly part, was that the, just the fact that, hey, you don't have a business that it's easy for barrier to enter that anybody can go and just compete against you. Is that what the monopoly concept is? Yeah. It comes from Warren Buffett's goal of, of investing in businesses that have a monopoly. So right. pick one thing, right. dominate, don't cross sell. I got you. Okay, great. Well, listen, it's been great having you on. I appreciate your time. I, I hope the audience uh, uh, learned just as much as I did. John, we're going to put the links below for people to order your book and we're going to put the link below on folks to find you. Do you want us to drive them to Twitter or your podcast? You know, best place to go is builttosell.com slash valuetainment. We actually put together a little page for your guys so that Fantastic. you can get a, a, yeah, a bunch of downloads, a bunch of videos. There's a, there's a checklist for the nine subscription models. It's just builttosell.com slash valuetainment. We're going to put that link as the first one to drive traffic to it. But with that being said, thanks for being a guest on Valuetainment. This was great. Thanks, Pat. So this is the first time Brooklyn is making it in a video. Every baby's made in a video before. Now it's Brooklyn's first. However... What an incredible interview to sit down and talk to a guy whose book impacted my life in 2012 when I read it. Curious to know what you took away from it. Comment below. I got two other videos I want you to watch. One of them is with the billionaire Chip Wilson who founded Lululemon. If you've never seen it, it's absolutely amazing, baby. Literally, it's a ridiculous video. You're going to watch it one day. The other one is how to scale your business as an entrepreneur. If you've never seen it, click over here. Having said that, if you enjoyed the interview, thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Can you say bye or no?
No? It's all good. I took it as a buy. Bye.